Ugh. Okay. How do I top that? I won't, can't. So this past week, it was I think on Tuesday, I was taking a quick pass through a collegial Facebook group focused on worship that I'm a part of, and I noticed a post from a colleague of mine that stood out in like a hundred and something ministers from coast to coast. They had a lot to say about this post, so I wasn't alone. This is what it read. We Unitarian Universalists are great at Easter Sunday's Alleluia's all day long, but I kind of worry that we seem to want to skip over the days preceding the Hallelujahs. Dot dot dot. Thoughts? <laughs> Everyone had a lot of thoughts. Big surprise. We know what days she's talking about. And she's right. Most Unitarian Universalist churches, we don't spend much time really getting into the awful week that Jesus just had, or ritualize Good Friday the way that our Christian siblings do. Most of us don't rush out to purchase the Passion of the Christ movie on our streaming devices and gather our family together for our annual viewing. Many of these agonizing parts of the Christian story filled with lament and disorientation and hopelessness and horror and death aren't really what blows our you-you hair back. <laughs> and I have a funny side story, by the way, about that movie, The Passion of the Christ. Do any of you know that one with Mel Gibson? Yeah. So, okay, being raised unchurched and without any sort of Bible study, when that movie came out in 2004, I, for some reason, decided to go see it by myself, thinking it was going to be about Christ's passion, like <laughs> what, what Jesus was passionate about. <laughs> and I was like so upset 30 minutes in that I walked out and called my husband and was like, that movie was awful. It was only about his crucifixion. It was depressing. What is passionate about that? <laughs> to which my husband, maybe I'm not alone. So the passion is the crucifixion. I, I didn't know that. Okay, okay that's my... <laughs> this might not come as a surprise to you, but... I must admit that I am kind of a alleluia's all day long kind of gal. Joy and hope are the guiding tenets of my life. They are hard earned. And I'm really grateful to get to live a life where most days I truly and genuinely wake up awestruck simply to be alive and have breath in my body and encountering and cultivating love and beauty, it is an authentic part of who I am. And blessed wisdom, which is what I like to call it, blessed wisdom continues to arrive in my life, teaching me about the something more than it's all good. In the same way that wisdom also wants us to know that there is something more than it's all bad, right? And this wisdom for me, something more than all good, this wisdom, like all of the wisdom that the God of my understanding injects into my life, it is mainly inconvenient, it is often unwelcome, and it is destabilizing. I don't like it, and I find God very annoying a lot of the times. Good, transformative wisdom is all of these things, annoying and destabilizing and inconvenient. It is my belief 
that sacred wisdom called by many names, my friends, comes to us in whispers, and then taps, and then bricks, if it's not heated, until it gets our attention, right? It is my belief that we are being flooded with this wisdom every second of our lives, through people, through events, through wisdom texts, sacred texts, the arts, nature, and the like. And it's up to us in this life to notice it, to heed it, and to be transformed by it in some evolving or healing way. Or, yes, we have this choice to spend our lives trying to dodge it, to the detriment of our well-being and any lasting sense of inner peace. And for me, learning how to be a more integrated, not all good, not all bad human that is guided by beauty and joy and hope and gives despair and loss and lost the same dignified place at the table. This is one of life's great and hardest lessons, for me at least. The story of Easter in its entirety is one of the many wisdom sources that teach us about this integration. But as with all wisdom teachings, it must be encountered as allegory, my friends. A symbolic story about the spiritual journey and the human condition, from psychic life to death to rebirth. This is how the ancients told sacred stories, through symbols. Father Richard Rohr's teachings have guided me greatly in this, and I have invoked him many times from this pulpit. Some of his Easter wisdom, this is a Catholic priest. He writes, Christianity can help us realize that death and resurrection are part of the evolutionary path toward wholeness. Something dies, but something new is born, which is why the chaos of our times is, in a strange way, a sign of hope. Something new is longing to be born within. Out of chaos, a star is born, he writes. Break down can be breakthrough if we recognize a new pattern of life struggling to emerge. In other words, we can't know hope and hallelujah really without knowing their counterparts. In the story of Jesus, the great despair, agony, and death that preceded the resurrection, right? Breakdown leads to break through. The first sermon that I ever preached was called When Your Headlamp Fails. And it told the story of a trek that I made to the top of Mount Dictus in Greece. This is where the entrance to a 400 foot, 400 foot deep cave is. It's called the Scatino Cave. And it was a sacred site to the ancient Minoan and Neolithic peoples. I was determined to have this day, one I'd been looking forward to for months, be a big, transformative, alleluia's all day long experience. Experience, how could it not be? The story goes something like this. Everything that could have gone wrong for me literally went 
wrong. I hadn't slept well the night before, so I was punchy and tired. Something was going on with my ankle, and it was driving me nuts and hurting, and I couldn't really walk very well. My stomach hurt from something I ate the night before. All of this and the near 90-degree heat landed me at the mouth of that cave in the worst mood possible. <laughs> and like a beautiful ritual was planned, didn't even hear it, didn't hear the words, didn't hear the song, all I could focus on was how utterly agitated I was and how agitated at how agitated at how agitated I was. And then, just as we began the descent, my headlamp went out. Fresh batteries, first time being used, tested several times, out. And really what you need to know here is that this was the one item that was literally starred with several stars on the required packing list. Next to it were the words, please buy a good one. You can't carry flashlights or phones because you need your hands to climb. The terrain is very uneven and steep and we will be entering pitch black darkness. So please buy a good one. So this trek down into this 400 foot deep cave is already treacherous and frightening without a headlamp, terrifying. I had to descend rickety, several story tall ladders, inch my way alongside 50 foot drop, scoot slide, feel my way around the dark desperately trying to make use of others' headlamps to no avail. I think I cried the entire time. Not just out of fear, but really just so much frustration and disappointment. This was not supposed to be how this went. And after landing with an inelegant thud, at the bottom, with cuts and gashes on my hands and arms and splotchy, tear-soaked face, all the headlamps were turned out. And we just sat down there in that dark silence for at least 15, 20 minutes. And it was enough time for me to consider, deep in that ancient cave, that my descent down, my mood, my broken headlamp, the fears, the tears, really all that had even preceded that day and had brought me to Greece in the first place was the hallelujah. Just not in the form I thought it should take, right? And it was enough for me to get that I needed to re-examine and expand my definition of wholeness and my crude, utterly finite understanding of what is all good and what is all bad. To be a human being means that we are often lost in the dark and that this can be the best part of being human. We are often descending. We are often agitated, unrested, and unwell in our bodies. It is called being human. We are often barren and fallow like the earth. We are often caught up in the fragilities of life personally, or as witnesses in the world that symbolically and literally aren't all that different from the horrible death of Jesus. We must plumb these depths. I'm speaking symbolically now, collectively and individually. And maybe some of you are like me. You just, you want to spiritually bypass. Just get to the lilies and tulips and bursting forth of spring and hope abundant and perpetually working headlamps. 
Beatitudes, skip, pass, skip, pass, skip, resurrection, right? And longing for this is a beautiful thing, as is creating it in the world. But we must get that true alleluias all day long aren't in spite of the preceding dark nights of the soul. They are because of them. And they are precious. The spiritual life, and really any spiritual practice worth its weight, is all about this balance and integration. Balance and integration. The reason why caves like Scatino were deemed sacred by our ancestors were because the descent down, the time spent in its deepest, darkest places, and then the emergence out towards light, literally and metaphorically embodied birth, death, and rebirth. These are, of course, the movements through the Christian story as well. Allegory for our own life's story and our collective one as well, breaking down, breaking through an ongoing series of symbolic births and deaths and rebirths. I wish we placed more value in embodied integrating rituals in nature like the one I had with that cave. And it's also heartening, right, to hear about more and more people returning to these wisdom teachings and lands and cultivating transformative healing and meaning in and from them. That feels really hopeful. And speaking of hope, I have to tell you that what offers me the most hope is how utterly we caught up we are with one another in this trying to integrate and be human beings. We really are sharing in this experience. My cave trek and all that happened that day was in community. My hands never left the hands of those women I trekked down with. And our friend Jesus was all about the we. No one was outside his circle of love and care. No one. Now, you don't have to participate in this if you don't want to, but everyone who is here, friends at home, this includes you. Try this with me. If you have ever known heartbreak, Put a hand over your heart. Look around. Everyone has a hand over their heart. If you have ever felt frightened or lost in your life, put a hand over your heart. Look around. If you have ever woken up agitated and brooding and just couldn't shake it, put a hand double up <laughs> over your heart. This is hallelujah. Just now, you have turned your pain and your private suffering into connection. This is the dynamic whole hope of Easter, from pain into connection. Alleluia. Alleluia. And I want to return, before I end, to some of our poet's wisdom, just in part, the humanist speaking of Easter by Kendall Gibbons, it happens over and over as the human journey unfolds. It happens to us and to the people we love. It happens to the righteous and the innocent. Crucifixion happens. And it feels like the end of the world every time. It feels like nothing could matter anymore ever. And then, and then, inevitably and miraculously, something happens next. Something happens, of course it does. Maybe the sun comes up, or the lilies do, spring rolls around, that happens. Or memories come, 
or someone needs you. Life happens, keeps happening. The dead don't rise, but we do. One day it happens, you take a breath, and it doesn't hurt to breathe. You start to see people again, really see them. Hope rises, community rises, you rise, we rise, life rises, not because death isn't real, crucifixion is not, just pretend. But something else is just as real. Something happens next. That is the other thing we know for sure. Love rises. Outrage rises. Faith rises. Tears rise. Hope rises. This I do believe. And so, my dear friends, as you move through the days ahead, let all that you are and feel rise with dignity so that you might better know how others feel and are with dignity. Your love, your outrage, your tears, your faith, hold tenderly your dark nights, hold tenderly your bright days, hold it all in your hands to your heart, the tears and the joys, and then hold it out to one another so that you might know you are not alone. And then if you feel so moved, speak and sing hallelujah to it. That is my prayer for us all and for this world on Easter. May it be so, and amen.